All right, another um, sermon request that I've had. I want to get one done here quick on this to answer this question. What about head coverings for women? Okay, a lot of uh, women out there that are professed to be saved, they wear something on their head. They feel that that's a requirement in Scripture. Well, we're going to look about that here in this video. We're going to start out here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to read verses 1 through 16. It says here, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this calls out the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Judge in yourselves. Is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. But if any man seem to be contentious, contentious we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Okay, so that's the uh, passage there that you're going to see this thing of head coverings. But now let's go back and go through it verse by verse, and I'm going to show you what the Bible is actually teaching here. Let's read verse 1 and 2 again. It says here, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Notice there that Paul commends them for following him, following his example. Okay? He says, I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. So Paul is saying it's a good thing that you are following me, following my example. Okay? Follow me even as I also, even as I also am of Christ. You know, follower of, he's a follower of Christ. He's saying, you follow me. Okay? That's a good thing that the Corinthians were doing there. Okay, but now let's look at the next verse. Okay, it says here in verse 3, but, okay, he's saying, it's a good thing you're following me, but, look what he says, I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. It was good that they were following Paul, but some of them were starting to really follow Paul. You know, to the point of thinking that he was somehow, you know, the fourth member of the Trinity or something. Not good. Paul's saying, it's good that you're keeping what I taught you, but don't follow me. You know, if you read back in the early part of Corinthians, I think it's uh, chapter 2 or 3. Let me just turn there quick. Yeah, chapter 3 here, 1 Corinthians, it says, uh, verse 4, For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? So Paul is saying, it's a good thing you're following what I taught you, but you're taking a little bit too far. Okay, I'm not the spiritual head of any man or any woman. All right, follow my example, but don't worship me, is what Paul is trying to say there. But notice the spiritual headship that's given here. In verse 3, I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So the spiritual hierarchy is God the Father, Jesus Christ, man, woman. Okay? 
Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 through 24 says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Okay? So you see that thing there, the spiritual headship. Now, let me ask you a question. Was anything said in verse 3 about a physical head covering? No. There wasn't anything in there about something on your head up here. Obviously, when Paul is saying there in verse 3, the head of every man is Christ, he's not saying that my head is the head of Jesus Christ, you know, physically speaking. No. And, you know, how about the head of the woman is the man? Boy, that'd be a problem, wouldn't it? You know, <laughs> be kind of an odd-looking marriage, you know. Uh, if your wife's head looked like yours as the husband, you know, it'd be bad. It's not talking about physical. It's talking about spiritual headship. That's what's going on there in verse 3. Now look at verse 4. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. The context there, what is the context? What was the context of verse 3? Was it physical? No. It's spiritual. And so what is Paul trying to say? Paul is trying to say that if you pray having your head covered, what's your spiritual headship as a man? Jesus Christ. So how could you cover Jesus Christ? How could you have that covered? Well, by praying to Paul in the name of Paul. Or by going into a little <coughs> booth someplace and saying, Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned, you know. Mm -mm. There's not supposed to be anybody between you as a man and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Okay, James chapter 5, verse 16 says, Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. All right, you're not supposed to confess your sins like the Vatican versions say. Okay, the false Bible versions will tell you to confess your sins to each other, to one to another. You know, you're not supposed to confess your sins to other sinners. Okay, you can confess your faults. That's a different thing. All right, but you don't go and pray through a man someplace. Because if you do, then you're dishonoring your spiritual head. You're the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Now you say, well, then a, then a man can pray, you know, he shouldn't take his hat off when he's going to pray. Well, I think that that's a good, you know, custom. I think that that's not too bad. But uh, you say, well, I don't agree with you, Brian. I think that there in verse 4, every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. You know, physical covers his head, dishonors Jesus Christ, his head. Okay, is that the way you interpret it? Well, then let me make another point. If verse 4 is a reference to a physical cover, covering, you know, you're not to cover your head when you pray or prophesy, what do you do when you're riding a motorcycle? Or if you're on a job and you're required to wear a hard hat, your head's covered, what about in the winter time when you have a winter hat on? Your head's covered, isn't it? You say, well, you can take it off when you're ready to pray. Really? What if you're on a motorcycle and you're and you're cruising along and somebody pulls out in front of you and you got to pray quick? You don't have time to take your helmet off. You mean to tell me you can if you'd pray and say, "Oh God, please help me," that you wouldn't hear that because you have a helmet on, your head's covered physically? Come on, think about that. And also, you have another problem. Because 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Pray without ceasing. Now, if you're not allowed to pray with anything on your head, that would mean that you could never, ever have a hat or a hard hat or a helmet of any kind. Which would seem kind of strange because over in Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about, you know, referring to the different parts of your Christian spiritual armor. It says the helmet of salvation. Christian men aren't allowed to ever wear anything on their head because it gets in the way of 
prayer or something, why would Paul talk about the helmet of salvation? It's kind of odd, isn't it? Okay, what's going on there? Well, verse 4 is talking about spiritual headship. You're not supposed to have a man between you and the Lord when you pray. You don't pray through another man. Okay, you don't go and you confess your sins to your pastor or something like that. That's heresy. You pray directly to God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 5 through 6. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, er, uncovered dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Okay, what do we have here? Well, here we have a Christian woman who is praying without a spiritual headship, without a man being spiritually over her. All right? A Christian woman should submit to one of three different men. Okay, have a man there to watch after her. Number one, if she's young enough, she should have her father. Okay, her birth father, not the Catholic priest, you know, I'm not talking about that. Birth father, all right, or stepfather or whoever raised you, all right. Number two, you should have, after that, you know, have a husband, okay. You say, well, I don't, I don't have a father and I don't have a husband, okay. Then a pastor, a man that you should listen to and you should, you should be somewhat submissive to in that you don't, Tell him off and whatever else. You know, submit to his authority as a man. If you have questions or whatever or prayer requests, you go to that man. Okay? Now, does that mean a woman can't pray directly to Jesus Christ? No, I didn't say that. Okay, a woman can pray directly to Jesus Christ. But in this life, we're going to see why in just a couple minutes, a woman is supposed to have a spiritual authority over her in the form of a man. It's the way it's supposed to be. And like I said, we're going to see why here in, a, in just a couple minutes. Okay? Well, what do you have there? In the context that there says there, if, if she's not, uh, if her head's not covered, um, that is even all one as if she were shaven. All right? And what's going on there? Well, this is kind of interesting. Because a woman who rebels against all male authority... I think Paul's just saying, well, you might as well just go ahead and shave your head then. And isn't it interesting that a lot of times when you see uh, sodomites, also known as lesbians, they will oftentimes shave the sides of their head? Hmm, kind of interesting there. You know, God's not for feminism. All right, feminism is, is an abomination before the Lord. But... Uh, one of the other arguments that is used, and I'm going to talk about this argument, and I'm going to show you why I don't use it. I have here a book by a brother named Randy, Randy J. Starr, and it's called uh, The Head Covering. Okay? It's a good book. Uh, I would recommend it. I think it's a pretty good, pretty good one. Uh, he's actually from a county right beside where I grew up. Um, that's where his church is, anyhow. But he talks about it, and he said that there is a historical argument that back in Corinth, the women that shaved their heads were prostitutes. You know, and so when Paul's saying, if you're not going to have a man to, to rule over you, you might as well just be a prostitute. You know, now my problem with that, that could be true. But you see, if that's the interpretation, the proper interpretation of this passage of Scripture, then that would mean that you would have to go to some other place to interpret the scripture. In other words, you'd have to understand the historical argument to make the Bible make sense. I have a problem with that. I'm not really into that. You know, I believe that this book is really all you need. Okay, it's fine to, to read other books and things, but I'm not really into historical arguments to prove certain scriptures one way or the other. Uh, it's kind of like going to Greek, in my opinion, and you can get you know, 40 different Greek texts out there and a whole bunch of different lexicons that tell you different meanings, different definitions of Greek words, and you can kind of make the text say what you want it to say. So, 
either one, I'm, I just, eh. I like to stick with the context there, with, the, with the, the actual text of Scripture. And I believe it's just simply saying, hey, if you're going to be a feminist, if you're not going to have a man running, you know, over over you that you can be submissive to, then just go, go on out and shave your head. Why don't you do that? You know, but if it's a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. You say, oh, I'd be ashamed to do that. Well, then you probably ought to get under male authority. Just the way that thing works. Now let's look at verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7 through 9. It says here, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the woman, or I'm sorry, neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. You say, well, when did that happen? Well, <clears throat> and remember there in verse 7, by the way, too, it said that the woman is the glory of the man. Glory. That'll be important later. But uh, when did this thing happen of when was the woman created for the man? Well, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him an help meet for him. And out of the ground of the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Okay, if you remember there, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 8 and 9 says, for the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. So don't get excited about this thing of, oh, I think it's sexist, I think it's awful that, that uh, a woman has to submit to a man. It's not a bad thing. It's the way God designed it. All right? Uh, women have different attributes that men don't have. Okay? Women are very sensitive. Uh, they're... they're there that they can, they're an emotional friend and a partner uh, that they can listen to the, a man and a man can kind of, you know, break down some of his defenses, you know, and talk to his wife on more of a personal level than he can with his co-workers, his buddies down at the shop or whatever. You know, women are very, very special uh, creatures in God's design, all right? So it's not a, a humiliating, demeaning thing for a woman to submit herself to her father, her husband, or a preacher. Okay? And to say, that's my pastor there, that's my husband, that's my father. You know, I'm going to ask his advice on things. That's important. Now let's look at verse 10. Okay, if you remember earlier I said it's, it's important that a woman submit herself to a man and not just be out there just going around by yourself with, I'll have no man to run me. But we're going to see about that here in verse 10. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Oh boy, time for controversy. Yeah, that's right. The Bible teaches in the Old Testament that angels bred with women. You say, what? what? Are you crazy? Well, in some ways, yes. <laughs> but not because of this. Turn to Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 through 7. We'll read that. It says here, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men of, which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. 
And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Okay, a couple points I want to make here. First of all, we're going to see here in just a couple minutes, I'm going to show you some other scriptures that prove that the sons of God are not regular men. You say, well, I believe that they are. Okay, how was it that they were creating giants then? By coming in under the daughters of men. Doesn't make much sense. I mean, if you'd have a supernatural angel breeding with a regular woman, I'm sure the offspring would be probably pretty interesting. Uh, what was going on there? Well, the, just as what it says, the sons of God were coming in under the daughters of men, producing giants. I'm going to show you in just a minute the proof that the sons of God are angels. But another thing I want to point out there is this thing of repenting. Now, I'm just going to kick a little other movement here while I'm right here. Uh, a lot of these uh, miserable modern apostates will say that repentance has no part in salvation. And this is one of their favorite things. I'll turn to here and they'll say, well, if repentance has to do with a sinner must repent before they get saved, then I guess that God must have been a sinner because it says that he repented. It's a ridiculous argument. Why? Because the term repentance, the word repentance, is determined by the or is defined, excuse me, by the context in which it's used. All right. What does repentance mean here? It means God turned from his blessing man to now he's going to judge man. He repented. He changed his mind. All right. When it says God repented, it means that he's changing his mind from mercy to, to judgment. When it says, when Jesus said, I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance, what's that mean? They have to change their mind about their sin. They can no longer just say, oh, I can live however I feel like living. Okay? Now, if somebody's teaching that they have to totally repent, get their life totally cleaned up and sin-free before they get saved, that's heresy. That's lordship salvation. But teaching that you preach to the lost, you need to repent of your sins. In other words, you need to have a different view of your sins, have a different view of your self-righteousness. You can't save yourself. You have to come to God as a sinner. That's true biblical salvation. That's not works. Right? Don't fall for that whole thing there. But who are the sons of God in the Old Testament? Job chapter 1 verse 6 says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Okay, what's going on there? This is up in heaven. Read the context. It's up in heaven. Uh, you're not going to have any regular men going up to heaven every day to present themselves before the Lord. Right? These are angels. You say, well, I don't really think I'm convinced. Okay? Job chapter 38, verses 4 through 7. Here God is asking Job these questions. He says, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. There you have it. In the Old Testament, now in the New Testament, the sons of God, we as Christians, we become the sons of God. I understand that. But in the Old Testament, every reference to the sons of God, it's always a reference to angels. And this right here proves that these sons of God are angels. Why? Because they were shouting for joy as the world was being created before man was formed. They're not the sons of Seth or some other thing, you know, whatever. They are angels. Don't let people deceive you into thinking otherwise. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 10 says, we will read it one more time, For this calls out the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Okay? Now, what is the woman's head there? Power on her head. What's the context? Well, what's the context of the passage so far? Male covering. A spiritual male covering. A strong man that knows how 
to keep the angels away from his wife or his daughter or a woman is in his congregation. That's what a woman should have. A Christian woman should have. But now let's just say this. For the sake of argument, we'll just say that this is a physical covering. That she's to have power on her head because of the angels. Okay? Let me ask you a question. What is power on your head if you're a woman? Does Paul saying anything in there about a different type of head covering? A cloth head covering? Does he say, well, you should wear a veil? You should kind of wear a little uh, doily looking thing here or you should wear kind of a bigger thing or some kind of a veil that comes down around the sides or something like that. Where's that? And there's a lot of different, you know, Christian type women that wear head coverings, you know, like, I mean, there's, you know, that's like more of an uh, Amish type there, you know. Is this one more powerful than other ones? Could you give me some scripture on that? What is it? It's the traditions of men. Misinterpreting of Scripture and the traditions of men. So what is all that thing is. Okay? And again, I was raised in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Okay? Um, my grandmother, grandparents on my father's side were Mennonite. My dad was raised Mennonite. Okay? So I'm not an outsider to the thing. I've been around head coverings all my life. All right? And I'm sorry, but they're not scriptural. Just the way it is. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 11 through 12. It says here, Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Okay? Here Paul is saying that the woman is some, not somehow insignificant as a Christian. It's not that you're just some kind of weak, helpless little thing and you just have to have a man there to protect you. That's not what Paul's trying to say. Okay? A saved woman can be a great spiritual help to her husband. All right? That's what he's saying there in those verses. But now, let's look at verse 13. And you see, verses 1 through 12, I believe Paul is talking about spiritual covering. The head covering of a woman is a man. The head covering of a man is the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? Not a priest, not a pastor. Jesus Christ, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. But now in verse 13, I believe Paul switches to the physical covering. Okay? Let's read this. Verse 13. Judge in yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Now wait a second. Why did Paul say judge in yourselves here, but not up in uh, verse 5? He said, but uh, every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. Down here in verse 13 he says judge in yourselves. What's going on? Well, I believe that Paul switched from spiritual head covering. First he defines what the real true head covering is. Then he says, okay, now let's talk about the physical head covering. And he says, judge in yourselves. And we're going to see here in just a couple minutes, that's basically what it boils down to. If a woman feels that she needs to wear some kind of thing on her head, okay, fine. If she says, no, I don't think I need to, according to Scripture, okay, fine. Judge in yourselves. Okay? It's not commanded. Okay? Verse 14 Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Hmm. Again, notice the distinction here. We're no longer talking about spiritual covering. We are now talking about physical covering. All right? You can see that in the verse there. Now, notice something else. What did it say in verse 14? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a sin unto him? Nope. It doesn't say that. It says it's a shame unto him. 
God looks down and he goes, oh boy, what a shame. What a man has long hair. doesn't say it's a sin. Okay, there's an issue of liberty there. A man has long hair, you know, because he's conforming to the world and whatever else. It's the style at the time or something. Well, the Lord's ashamed of him, but it's not a sin. It's not some kind of a thing where he's going to lose his salvation or something like that. No, no. A man has long hair, well, okay. God says it kind of makes him look girly or whatever, but, you know. And there's another problem, too, with it. Revelation chapter 9, verse 7 and 8 says, And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. Hmm. Do you want to look like some kind of a satanic creature that comes up out of the bottomless pit in the time of Jacob's trouble? Okay, then be a man with long hair, like a woman. Kind of interesting, you know, because, you know, this, this thing of a man having long hair, I've seen a lot, a lot of times, you see him from behind, you think, oh, that uh, lady's got some nice hair, and then they turn around and you go, whoa, <laughs> that's not a lady, that's a guy. You know, just pretty messed up. But um, notice in verse 15, it says, But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. The fact is, a saved woman with long hair brings glory not only to herself, but also to her husband. And what do we read back here? Verse 7, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man so a woman with long beautiful hair with very you know nice feminine hairstyle she brings glory to her husband because men look at her and they go wow what a beautiful woman that guy must really be something else to get a wife like that or even a daughter like that you know if you're a father and you have a real beautiful daughter they look and they say wow you know your daughter is quite beautiful it brings glory to the man because of the woman's beautiful feminine hairstyle. And it's interesting too because if you look at a lot of songs and stories that have been written, a lot of times they're about a woman's long hair. Pretty interesting. But let me ask you a question. If you say, well, I still believe in, in, a, in a head covering, you know, something up here, when the Bible clearly says that the woman's hair is given her for a covering, but you say, I still think that there's supposed to be something on top. Look at the picture here again. Let me just zoom in here a little bit. Now, <clears throat> just take a look at her hair. Can you see her long, beautiful hair? No, you can't. What do they do? They take their hair, these women, these Amish women, these Mennonites, I've seen them. They'll take it and they'll pull it all up tight, you know, up like this. And they pull it all up and they put pins in it and stuff. And then they put a covering on top. Does that make any sense? Why not let your hair down? Let your hair be a nice, beautiful, long covering. Bring glory to yourself and also to your husband. Why make your hair pull it up like the style of a man? You know, have it all tighten up all like that and put a thing on top. Doesn't make any sense. Okay? It doesn't. But the whole fact of the matter is what I just said a little bit earlier there. The statement that ends the argument once and for all is that her hair is given her for a covering. That's all you really need to know. If you're a Christian woman, all you need for a covering, a physical covering, you need a male as your spiritual covering, but your physical covering, all you need on your head is beautiful feminine hair. I didn't say that it has to be down to your belt in the back to qualify as scriptural hair covering or something. I didn't say that. It just has to be feminine. If your hair is the same length as mine, it's not feminine, okay? Let it grow longer. 
It should, people should look at you and say, there's a woman. All right? God wants a distinction between the sexes. Okay? Wants men to look like men, women to look like women. You say, well, I'm still not convinced. I'm sorry, Brian, but I, we have these very strong beliefs. We're gonna, I want our women to wear head coverings. Okay, let's look at verse 16. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. I'm not going to fight about it. If a man is contentious and he says, well, I think that a woman needs to wear a head covering. I want my women to look like this. I want my wife. I believe women should wear head coverings. Do you want to be contentious? Okay. Go ahead. Paul says there, we have no such custom. And notice he doesn't say doctrine. He says custom. You know, judging yourselves. He says, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. You want to do it? Go ahead. Judging yourselves. If you want to do that, that's fine. If a man wants to have long hair, it's a shame unto him. And I'll tell you right now, if a woman takes her beautiful hair that God gave her and pulls it all up into a little ball here and puts a thing on top of it, I believe that's a shame to her. She's not bringing glory to herself. She's not bringing glory to her husband and consequently to the Lord. That's my beliefs on the thing. So my advice, ladies, don't shave your head or have a hairstyle that makes you look like a man. Okay? Look and act like a woman. Men, don't grow your hair long. Okay? You should have your hair short and look and act like a man. It's just as simple as that. Really not that difficult. Does the Bible force a head covering? No. And by the way, if you notice too there in the first couple parts of the, the chapter there, verses 1 through 12, it says about praying with your head covered or uncovered or whatever. Praying. It doesn't even say all the time that you're supposed to be wearing it. You know? So that you can't even get that out of the first 12 verses. It's clearly spiritual, not talking physical. But even if you could, it's just saying when you pray or prophesy. And most of the time that you'll see women with coverings, they're not praying, they're not prophesying. They're going out shopping, they're out in the garden working and stuff like that. So... This teaching of a forced head covering, like that right there, the way that thing looks, totally without scriptural support. Don't feel pressured if you're a woman into wearing some kind of a cloth head covering. It's unscriptural. Not necessary. That's going to be it for this video. Thank you for watching.